Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Bensignor. Today is Wednesday, December 21st, and welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. What do we have on tap? Well, we're going to just concentrate on one thing this week in our trader education series. We are going to discuss with the title, Beware the Analyst Who Misses the Big Move Before Changing Ratings. So before we get to that, let me just tell you about some of the products we have here at In The Node Trader. Firstly, we have a weekly ETF Tactical Trader Report, generally comes out on Thursday evenings. And what this report does is give you a good overall view of all the macro factors going on in the market by going through those markets that affect the U.S. equity market. So we are talking about doing a deep dive into the U.S. Treasury market, corporate spreads, uh, the dollar, gold, sometimes oil, any of those kind of big macro factors. We look at the charts, we kind of dig into what we need to know, which way they're likely heading and how those are going to affect the stock market. And then we do our deep dive into the S&P 500. And here's where I give you all the specific trading levels that you need to know in order to be able to hopefully exploit the upcoming moves and be able to do a better job than simply sitting in a passive index and taking whatever that return is. So this is a trading oriented piece. Generally, the time frame for our holdings are weeks to months. Uh, these are not long-term investments so though occasionally we end up holding something for six months or more but generally we're looking in a shorter term time frame not day trading or in one week out the next multiple weeks to multiple months is the expected time frame for what we're putting on to hopefully capture that next move in an underlying stock or, or in this case it's an etf because we do etfs in this report um, I then give a new recommendation of an ETF to trade, um, either on the long or short side, and then review every open trade we have until we close it out. So I will walk you through the trade. When we initially put on a trade, I give you a target and a stop. And sometimes we need to, you know, something starts working our way. Let's say it was a long idea, so I'll start raising the stop. Uh, essentially what they call trailing it so we can protect profits in case the stock or again the ETF comes off in price. Um, so from the time we get you in until we get you out, you are week by week kind of held hands with in order to uh, maximize our profits. The other report that we have as a written report is known as the 7-Eleven report. This is a monthly report that comes out on the last day of each month. And the goal of this report is to outperform the S&P 500 Spider ETF by being in no more than seven of the 11 macro sector spider ETFs like XLK, XLE, XLP, etc. There are 11 sectors to the market. Each one has a spider ETF associated to it that tracks it virtually perfectly. And um, our, our goal here is by being in no more than seven of the 11 sectors uh, per month, we aim to not be a part of the underperforming sectors and only be in the ones that we think will kind of hold their own against the S&P or do better. And you can see the results here through November 30th. We do results once a month at the end of the month through the end of November. We are outperforming the S&P 500 by 5.46% this year, of which we've outperformed in 10 of 11 months so far. And since I started this report 28 months ago, August 1st of 2020, we have outperformed the S&P by 11.64%. Um, these are outstanding numbers in the money management industry. And um, we this is definitely in the top decile of all who are benchmarked to the S&P, if not in the top 5%. Uh, 
if you are a person or an institution or a financial advisor or somebody who's got money or your client's money in spiders to just be part of the full market, I highly recommend you take a look at this. Um, you can sign up and get a free seven day trial to either of these two written reports. And you should check them out because uh, based upon at least the results we've had to date, we are easily beating the market and you would be much better off in something like this than being in the SMPs. The third product I have are individual coaching services, and these are done for either financial advisors or individual investors. If you're an individual investor, I generally will help in our initial discussion, find out what the, how you trade, what your process is, and help you better improve because so many people simply don't have the process or they have a process, but they don't understand money management. Um, the emotional slash psychological side of trading takes over how and when they make the decisions they do and they never seem to get ahead or they lose a lot of money trading. Um, I have been coaching traders for years and years. Um, you can tell kind of how I present uh, even in these webinars. I am about educating people and trying to make them better. Uh, but many of you really do need individual coaching in order to be able to get past your own hurdles that you uh, set up. You don't try to do it, but because you're human, they're kind of just there. And most people can't seem to get out of their own way when it comes to trading, and therefore uh, they don't get the success that they're looking for at all. So I help do that. So you can sign up for coaching sessions too. Uh, on the website and uh, those who are financial advisors um, often come with a whole bunch of other issues that they need deal with when dealing with clients and their uh, both their the the advisors own behavioral biases and as well as the clients and I'll help you work through how to better approach talking with clients having success with clients how you approach the market do you simply just uh, you know, if you work for a bigger financial advisor type firm, are you simply taking the allocations that the firm is giving um, as how you get your clients into the different sectors, et cetera, or are you doing work yourselves? Whatever it is, I will help you do your job better and up your client retention. And after all, that is really the name of the game is keeping your clients for the long run. So financial advisors who are watching this video, I also um, ask you to think about how coaching can help you do your jobs better. All righty. Uh, you're probably watching this on my YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, go to uh, youtube.com slash in the no trader, click on that subscribe button. Uh, that'll help pop up my videos right on top of your YouTube page each time you log in. I also occasionally tweet. So uh, my Twitter handle is at in the no trader. So you should uh, follow me on Twitter too. Okay, let's, um, let's just do what I plan on doing today. We're not going to go through charts today. I simply want to finish out the year and this will be the last webinar I do for the year. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this is my 48th one of the year. So um, barring, you know, occasionally I take time off. We've been pretty darn consistent in providing you education uh, week after week throughout the year. Go to YouTube, put my name in or put in the no trader in and you will come across um, probably something about, a, I don't know, I'm guessing 170. Um, videos that I've done over the last several years in order to help educate you on better ways to approach the market, whether it's specific in how to draw your trend lines more accurately and to understand which two points you can actually use to take your trend lines from to, um, for instance, what we're doing today, which is a discussion about um, analysts who missed the big move and then start changing ratings only after a large move has happened and how to take advantage of that. Um, there are 
dozens and dozens and dozens of videos that you can um, watch that I've done over the last few years on YouTube. Okay, so let's get into this. Beware the analyst who misses the big move before changing ratings. So um, I think about this because something very specifically has happened, you know, this year, and it happens all the time, but there's something that, that comes to mind that I want to share with you and kind of um, help you better deal with this when it happens is part of the success I have is because um, A, I've been at this game for over 40 years and B, um, the positions that I've had on Wall Street over that 40 year career have given me unique insights into the key jobs that people might have who manage money and make uh, influential decisions on how other people invest. So for instance, I traded on the floor at the commodities exchange for 12 years. So not only do I completely understand the game of trading, but having been a pit trader down in the thick of things on the floor, yelling and screaming um, prices, buying and selling, I learned a ton about the psychology of how and when people make the decisions they do. And it was right there, both my own and observing everybody else around me. So that's very different than sitting in an office and watching a screen, a quote board, and saying, oh, the market was down today, but having not much sense beyond looking at a screen or reading something in the newspaper. I was, I lived and breathed the actual making of the prices that show up on your screen. And that's a very unique perspective to have. I was on the sell side for many, many years on Wall Street as chief market strategist of almost every firm I was at. Um, and there, not only did I have colleagues, other strategists and economists and analysts who I would consistently talk to. Um, but I was in the thick of it in the sense that too, here we are representing like major firms on the street, publishing research and having meetings over which way should we think about the markets. And one of the great things I'll tell about my time at Morgan Stanley was that that was not a firm that um, only came out with a single call from the firm to the street, not at least then. So I used to work with uh, Byron Wien, Barton Biggs, Stephen Roach, Henry McVeigh, um, the other well-known economists and strategists of the firm. And as long as we could each come up, uh, or better say, defend our opinion, that opinion could be published. Um, so it's not like the firm had this one call that we're bullish. We each had our own views. Um, and it was often that quite amusing for both our salespeople to listen to our opposing views, but also um, the readership across all of uh, Morgan Stanley client base. So you might have, I could be bullish at the same time, you know, an economist is completely bearish, let's say the bond market. I'm, I, I think, you know, rates are going up at the same time the economist thinks rates are going down and we each could defend ourselves, but again, this was all about understanding, learning, and being a part of um, the whole big process. And then also for several years, I was on the buy side of Wall Street, on the money management side. Um, and there, you're in the role of a portfolio manager. So now you've gone from being on the sell side to being on the buy side. You become a client of the sell side. Now you're covered by all the salespeople on Wall Street. Um, and you learn from that perspective, not only what the sell side is trying to push to you, but also the decision making process when you're actually trading, quote, other people's money. So I have, I'm, I'm in kind of, not a lot of people have this background of having spent years trading, years on the sell side and years on the buy side. And that background helped me develop the skills that I have in order to be able to consistently outperform the market. So. 
one of the things that I was thinking about is um, earlier this year, in fact, here, let me pull up a chart. No, no annotations on it or anything. And now switch it to the ticker that I want. And this is the ticker of, this is the chart of Netflix. And obviously in fourth quarter 2021, this goes up to $700 a share, then has uh, starts its decline and falls from $700 a share down to about 165 in May. And now, you know, recently got to just over three and a quarter, and now it's about 291. So as the stock is plummeting, and some of these plummets, that these real big moves down came off of earnings misses, where the stock would fall um, 30% kind of overnight. So the next day, the stock opened up 30% lower, um, you know, huge misses. So what do the street analysts do? They keep lowering their targets. Many of them kept their buys, some adjusted to neutrals, um, very, very few turned into actual sells. And so as this is falling, uh, somebody who had a $800 target lowers their target to $600, you know, and we keep falling. And eventually as this keeps plummeting, um, the target price has come down, but analysts refuse to kind of walk away from there by ratings on this plummet here off in in april when that occurred i did as much work as i could to figure out where's the likely point that this was going to bottom in other words where were where were analysts going to you know turn their views and essentially, instead of having had the opportunity, which they all had to lower their ratings way up here, they decided to lower ratings down here. And um, I did a whole bunch of um, ways of analyzing where I thought this could end. And I decided back in April to put a good till cancel order in to buy the stock at 100, actually just beneath 165, 164 and change. And whether I was lucky or not, I'm not sure, you know, it's always, it's a little of both, but the day that made the low in um, May, the low for the year was 162.71. I bought the stock at 164 and change. So I got long the day that made the low for the year. And I got my clients long, my institutional clients. Uh, so I sent out a flash note, I think it was on May 12th, um, that a unique opportunity had arisen in Netflix to get long the stock. And this is the subsequent results was a rally up to 200 a pull back to test the low and then a massive move higher on december 2nd two weeks ago um i sent out a flash note to exit the stock and i thought that that was all it was going to go um and so here's the here's the the point of this story a week after I get clients out at an average price of 311. Two analysts on Wall Street upgrade the stock, one from Wells Fargo and one from Cowan. And their upgrade, I'm gonna switch this to a daily chart. Their upgrade created this, here I'll, I'll circle it for you, created this little up thrust right here to create new highs for the move. And this is the subsequent move since then. So I get long here on the left. Here, let's make these different colors. So let's make this, let's say a bright blue. And I get out here. So the analysts are selling, we get long. 
I get out, the analysts are now buying. So they weren't content with getting long or upgrading the stocks, telling people to buy it when the stock was at 165, 170, 190, 200, 210, 220, 250, 27. They waited for the stock to double, virtually double in price. In fact, their upgrade officially made the price a double off of the May low before they decided these supposed experts on the street who understand Netflix, their earnings, their future cash flows, all the things that a fundamental analyst studies, they decided that all of this wasn't good enough to rally, uh, to, to tell people to get long. But now, now that the stock has doubled, they decide to get long. And of course, they trap all these buyers who instantly now have a very, let's see, if you got in at, let's say, I don't know, 320 and it's trading 290, so that's 30 bucks over 320. So you're down 9% in a flash. And the point here is that the timing of fundamental analysts upgrades and downgrades when they have missed a significant move is almost always wrong. And it presents an opportunity for those who understand the game, how to exploit that. So not only did we get out just before they decided to create the top by upgrading, but it now also gives me a sense of where I could short the stock. And then you're thinking, well, why would you short a stock if analysts are starting to upgrade? Well, because generally their timing is horrific. They watch a stock double in price before they start deciding that, ooh, maybe I better start turning bullish again. Now, did I haphazardly pick the level I did to get out? No, I had reasons, which my clients understand because I explained them at the time. So now I look more to sell into this rally as a trader, kind of short into the rally, thinking that the high that was made can very well stay the high for some time. And this, this, this stock has downside before it could ultimately go higher. So might the analysts be right six months or a year from now? Maybe. Do I think they're going to be right in the near term? No. Did they present an opportunity to actually go in the opposite direction? They did. And that's why it's dangerous to follow analysts who miss big moves before they change their calls. Something to think about as a new year is about to come upon us. And you'll see, as usual, lots of rating analysts, uh, analyst ratings changes. Um, take a look at the moves preceding those changes before you decide to just jump on board because some analyst upgrades or downgrades the stock. That's how we're going to end this year. Uh, no webinar or video next week for me. I'm taking the week off, so I will see you again the first week of January. I hope you enjoyed these and uh, have a wonderful holiday season. I'm Rick Bensignor, and this has been In the No Trader.